while you imagine a situation, I don't think either is too tough, really. Uh, the question is, why are you a Lutheran? Uh, the imagined scenario is global thermonuclear war and a, a nuclear winter, three years of clouds and bad crops. Why are you a Lutheran? Why is it on the sign? What's it mean when you talk to your friends? Do they know? Do you know? When you visit other Lutheran churches, are they like ours? Or are they different? What's the Reformation? That's kind of the same question, only you may not know. We bring in a lot of other Christians when we ask the, the question that way. If we say, what's a Lutheran? Like, most of American Christianity is not involved. If we say, well, what's the Reformation? Suddenly, everyone except the Catholics is, like, involved. So I think that's more important personally, the Reformation, than the name Lutheran. Uh, the Reformation is what makes the name Lutheran, at least at one point, and definitely on our sign, <laughs> mean Bible, <laughs> grace, and faith. And then from there, things like the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer. What does this mean? And all that, right? But that is all about reforming you and me and us and our children from whatever we've inherited, good or bad, and there's usually both, right? Although right now, again, uh, global thermonuclear war, I don't know. Are you old enough to remember, uh, what was it, uh, Matthew Broderick and the Monkees? The, the game, I don't remember. It's a movie, and it terrified me as a kid. And I thought it was over. I thought it was done. The wall came down, blah, blah, blah. And here we are, and I got I to just ask the question, because it really isn't about, like, if this guy or that guy's smart enough. It isn't about that now. It's just like, if this guy or that guy's dumb enough, and then everyone else flinches, Right? And every morning I wake up and I think about this for like 30 seconds, a minute and a half, because it's in the news, right? Are you ignoring it? I don't know how you would ignore it. Um, I think about it for like a minute and a half, and then I say, Jesus, thank you. Hallelujah. I'm going to do my life today. And I walk back to the Bible, and I start to study the wisdom of the Psalms and the Proverbs, and they remind me that my life isn't about what happens to this guy. Except for that I can know that the God who controls what happens to the sky, no matter how bad it gets, also is my God and with me. So that whatever happens, he will be with me that day for me to call upon him in praise. Yes. Uh, thanks. Yes. In prayer. Dear Jesus, give me the daily bread today now that it's a nuclear winter. I like that my religion goes with me right through that wormhole. I don't even have to worry about it, really. I can walk past it in the morning and go deal with the, the leaves in my yard, which is frankly the biggest thing on my conscience, you know? So the Reformation is about how that kind of freedom is Christianity. The kind of freedom from fear, the kind of freedom from death, the kind of freedom from the stories of man. And it doesn't mean I'm not going to actually do something about the things I can do something about. It just means that when the scriptures are alive in the midst of you as a human and us as a people, all the stories of the world combined can't drown out our hope. Ever. And that's what all our texts today are going to give us, I pray. We're going to try to go through as much of it as we can. The whole bulletin, you'll need your Bible for that Old Testament reading. But just start on the front of the bulletin unless you want to dive over to Proverbs 6 in your Bible. But it's there in the bulletin for you today to move quickly. Proverbs 6, 20 to 24 and 27 to 28 the whole front end of Proverbs is an exhortion to, excuse me, exhortion, extortion. That's the wrong one again. Exhortation, there's a difference. Extortion is when I steal from you, right? Exhortation is when I encourage you. The whole book of Proverbs is an exhortation to reading the Bible. Proverbs 1 through 7 is like, read the Bible, and by the way, read the Bible. Whatever you do, don't forget, read the Bible. 
to the point where for a while I thought, I thought that section was kind of boring and didn't have much to say. It wasn't until I started reading Proverbs chapter 3 as a chapter every day that I started to realize how different it was from chapter 4, 5, and 6 and how it was blowing me away and I couldn't even realize how deep it was yet. Now, that said then, when Proverbs 6.20 says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. This is a refrain in an epic poem called Proverbs 1-9. through And it's bringing you back to a new starting point. It's like a new stanza, a new verse, right? And there's multiple stories being woven on the same theme up through the book, but it's all about, My son, keep what I'm giving to you. And both of these things, the law and the command, they're words. They're words, right? They're written down. The commandment, he then says, is a lamp and the law a light. Are you, are you old enough to remember Amy Grant? I, I got to give her some credit for planting faith in my heart as a child through a, a vinyl record in the, <laughs> the shed carpet living room. Yeah. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path as a six-year-old. The language of the Psalms and the hope that that gave me. I danced. I remember dancing to that song. The commandment, the word is a lamp and a light. Would that, I don't want to demean my parents in front of you all, but you know, the song was on, but then we didn't open the Bible and read it together. We didn't, you know. So the song was there, thank God, but the, the Reformation in the house, it wasn't alive. We sang a good song, don't get me wrong, uh, um, but it, the reformation of our hearts, it, it wasn't where, where I would have found more hope, I think, as a child. That said, uh, it's very important. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Bind them continually upon your neck. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. The poetry is there about all the time, right? But reproofs of instruction, or that word instruction in the King James, it usually is the Hebrew musar, discipline. Think of the word disciple. Go and make disciples of all nations. The reproof of discipleship is the way of life. Now let me give you a Lutheran word, repentance as discipleship is the way of life. Expect when you walk forward to not have everything right all the time. Expect that as you seek to be good, there will be those who are evil and you can't stop them from making your life evil too. Expect that your own heart's going to participate in that more than you realize. And then walk in the way of life. Know that. You're free though here. You're not trying to earn something before God. Expect God to disciple you. Expect him to correct you. Expect him to chasten you sometimes. If you bump your head for the third time, don't do it a fourth. Yeah, that's the idea here. And so his word will be with you wherever you go. This is the idea too, that when that word is in you day by day, doesn't matter what your study plan is, it's going to take over your spirit. It's going to reform you and that will protect you from this evil woman. Uh, I like how it ties the evil woman to her flattering tongue. She is not true. She hides what she means. And of course, this evil woman is an image of of the devil himself, yes. So with this admonition to read the Bible on this Reformation Sunday, let's do a nice big Bible story and look at 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 34 uh, in your Bible, page 386 again. The chapter begins on, on the page before where it says, uh, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years. And then you heard read, uh, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land, he sent in to repair the house of Jesus, the temple at the center of Jerusalem. Uh, the history, to get to this point, long and varied but let's just say he inherits rank paganism and nothing but, and he's cleaning up and he decides uh, all the days of his life, who's talking to this kid? He's eight years old. He's king. He decides, let's clean the temple they've been ignoring. It's all just broken down and dusty because they hate Jesus, right? They have. That's what they did. He says, let's clean that temple. But he doesn't really get around to that till he's 18, right? So the guy reigns for 10 years, eight 
to 18. I just can't fathom it. I, but it speaks well of him. And then in that 18th year, he decides to, to fix this temple. Verse 9, they came to Hilkiah the high priest and gave him the money that had been brought into the house of God, which the Levites, the keepers of the threshold, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim and from all the remnant of Israel and from all Judah and Benjamin and from the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they gave it to the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord. And the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord gave it for repairing and restoring the house. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for binders and beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. This is the kind of reading that can be very uh, uh, glossy over, right? It's easy to kind of tune out to some of that. It's where slowing down and asking yourself, you know, what does the verse mean helps to see the picture and like wide screen here of all the people and the logistics and the pieces of equipment and the, the knowledge and the money that had to happen for this thing to take place. Now it's, it's hard to just envision that as I read it. This is why I like the Kingstone comic books, by the way. Uh, they are a comic book. They are by no means realistic. But what they, they do is they at times make you slow down enough to say, oh, look at what was happening you know, around the story. And so any way you can do that here, uh, again, they're just going in and doing the real work of reconstructing this once gold-plated building, you know, uh, that's now in ruins. Um, they did the work faithfully, verse 12 tells us, um, all the Levites and so forth, verse 13. But then verse 14, while they were bringing out the money that they had brought into the house of the Lord, Elkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. And is this like that moment? I, I don't know. I, is this the first time you've heard this story? You heard it before? The first time I heard this story, I think it's just like, wait, what? <laughs> like, you lost it? <laughs> like, how'd you, how'd you lose it? It was in the Ark of the Covenant. I thought, like, what happened? Like it's, it's, uh, it's one of those moments that's almost like the end of Indiana Jones too, Ark of the Covenant, the hiddenness, the secretness of it all. Oh, God had so allowed their coldness to his word to become what they were that they didn't even notice when the Bible got taken away. We're in a much better place than that, I think, aren't we now? Yeah, good time to repent and rejoice that we have the Bible right in the pew in front of you. You got one at home. They're easy to buy. They're all over the place. But it's its own kind of flood now, isn't it? Getting to the Bible, finding it in the midst of the day, right? So the battle's still real. I love, I love the, the vigor of all of these men in the story, even though it's, it's clearly filled with fear, which I'm not exactly wanting to go into a moment where I get to be this afraid of God, right? <laughs> Although sometimes I'm there. Uh, uh, but their vigor, their vigor. Then Hilkiah, verse 15, answered and said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. I, I see him kind of, they don't run. I see him running. He didn't run because you were dressed like me, right? You'd fall down. You'd have to hitch up your, you'd gird up your loins, literally, and then, then run, and it was considered undignified. Uh, but I, I still picture him just running because he's like, on one hand, this is really good. On the other hand, this is really bad. And I'll, I'll confess, that has been my experience in reading the Bible since 2020. I really dove in with a different agenda to you know, study it more. <laughs> and, and on the one hand, like I found so much just spirit. It's just rejoicing me every day to find more. On the other hand, it, it made me think once or twice about my neighborhood and my city in ways that I had not before. Especially when I realized how much God hates the shedding of innocent blood. And then lets it stack until it turns into a fire that crushes the city. And that this just happens again and again throughout the Bible. You just can't ignore it. This is how it works, right? So it's, it's good and bad. You find, you find the truth, and yet the truth means change. Thankfully, the truth of God that means change is grace. 
And this is what we're going to get here in the story. Although initially, though, they're terrified here. I found this book. We got to read it. Uh, verse uh, 15 ends. So it gives the book to Shaphan. Shaphan's kind of like the administrator in this whole story, the name that keeps coming up again and again. He brings the book to the king. And notice, I love it. He's like, good news, bad news, right? So king, all the stuff you wanted done, everything you said to do, our list, here it is. We did it all. It's all good, okay? We're good. Now, good news, right? Bad news. Bad news. Hilkiah, the priest, verse 18, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it before the king. Now, this is going to be Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's going to take a while. Probably starts okay, you know. Oh, in the beginning, he created. Oh, it's a good story. Oh, Joseph. I like that guy. That guy's neat. Okay, okay. End of Deuteronomy. (gasps) We're all going to get just destroyed because we're not doing what it says. And the penalties are mind-bogglingly terrifying. I'm not going to go into them now, but you you can see the king's response. Like he's not in his lazy boy anymore. He gets up and he tears his clothes. He reforms his heart. What does that mean? He says, whatever it is I thought I was doing, I obviously didn't know what I was doing, and I am wrong now. I repent. Uh, One of the... The funniest things I've, I've kind of experienced as a practice of Christianity is the capacity to repent of things I didn't ever think of as sins before, like anxiety. You know, I'm, I'm an anxious person. I'm a very anxious person. I, I don't doubt that having the cup of coffee here with me isn't helping. Nonetheless, you know if you know. But, but that said, I can, I can really just repent of that. I can be like, oh, you know, Jesus, I'm anxious. I'm really afraid and overwhelmed about these things. And I'm, I'm sorry. And the strangest thing is that that's not an anxious experience. It's a calming experience to do that. I don't think it's magic. I just think it's God and humanity and how he made us. The king tears his clothes and he lets it out. (laughs) I imagine he's wailing and screaming and a number of other things. He commands the men who are with him, Shaphan and Hokiah, their names you'll recognize by now, I hope, you know. Go, verse 21 says, inquire of the Lord for me and those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. Because he listened and he, he knows, great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do all that is written in this book. That's the right response. Right. Well, it, it says this, so let's do that instead. <laughs> right? Oh, the Bible says that's wrong. Well, it's going to be true when it says that. That response is a really good one. And just to assume that is always going to open the door for more. And this isn't the kind of truth where, like, I checked it off, I know it, I got it done. To know the difference between wisdom and discipline is going to be a daily renewal and drowning in your sinful condition in God's love for you in spite of your sinful condition and for the love that that will create in you, especially for others who share that hope. Hmm? Okiah and the others go to Hulda. Hulda is a prophetess, and we don't have time today to debate women's ordination. We don't ordain women because women can't be fathers. It's that simple. Uh, Ask me some other time. Hulda being a prophetess, usually if you see a woman leading in the Old Testament, it means they're about to get destroyed. That's what it means. And in fact, they're about to get destroyed. And the king knows that and goes to the one person they know still has the Bible memorized or something like that. She can kind of say what it said. She speaks for Jesus at least. And they say, what what does it mean? I'm not going to read through it all here. You heard it before. You can read it again this afternoon, but you hear the curse. She's like, yep, you're right. You're done. Oh, man. I mean, imagine that about our little thermonuclear war concept this morning. You know, dear Jesus, will you tell us? Yep, it's over. Whoa. You know, go home and do what? We went out for uh, a little evening last night, and my wife said, you know, should we take the Prius or the Jeep? I said, honey, if the world ends today, I'm taking the Jeep. And I, <laughs> but why not? And this is the freedom that you have, really. Not to gratify the flesh, 
but to see that it doesn't really matter. Because he has you. And he's prepared this moment now to be a good one. So take it. And take it with song. Right? She also then says, though, and I do want you to see this, verse 26, but to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you should say to him. Right? A different message, Josiah. Yep, the country's done. But because your heart was tender, right, as opposed to, say, a hard heart, so it's hard, soft, it's receptive, it receives the word. Because your heart was tender and you humbled, that means, you know, abased or, or made yourself small before God when you heard his words. You just believed them. They're true and it's going to happen, right? That, that actual belief, that belief in the wrath is good, yeah? Because of that, when you heard it about this place, uh, because you have torn your clothes and wept before me. So God acknowledges the visible symbol, the act of tearing clothes. You know, fasting is connected to this, by the way. Uh, he says, I have heard you. Verse 28, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back word of the king. He goes out and he applies the Bible to everything he does and he reforms the entire country. And for a good 14 years, it goes really, really well until end of story kind of sad He's prophesied to die in peace, but he goes to war against someone who's not going to war against him. So he starts the fight, and then he dies. And it's a little early if you're living in Jerusalem. I would have wanted that guy around for another generation or so. I can have a son and raise him. doesn't happen. But the Reformation does happen. And the story of Josiah's Reformation is, to me, the most inspiring thing about being a Lutheran. Because it means go read your Bible and find it there. Whatever else we say anywhere else, it's in the Bible first, and it's more powerful when it comes from the text. And so, of course, you know the story of Berea by now. I hope I'll say it again. Turn the page in your bulletin, right? Acts chapter 17. We're just going to look at verses 10 and following. We're after this whole ordeal in Thessalonica where a Greek named Jew, Jason, does convert, this means it's probably a Hellenistically influenced or a Septuagint-leaning group, but it divides the whole place up, and it turns into a big fight for power in the congregation, and they bring the city authorities into the matter, and those who do believe decide it's time to send Paul out of town. And so, again, uh, verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. It's kind of southwest through some hilly mountain area. It's beautiful country, um, but it's, it's a little more rugged where they're going away from the city. Uh, when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more, there's 10 Jewish men then in this community, at least. These were more fair-minded, sometimes translated as noble-minded, than those in Thessalonica. What does it mean that they're fair-minded? It is that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So it's, it's twofold, the spirit of God in the New Testament through the name Jesus Christ. It is twofold. One is that the words of the Bible are proclaimed out loud to you in Jesus' name, and you hear it, and you receive it, you believe it. That's conversion, that's faith, that's preaching, that's uh, admonition. It happens throughout our lives. It's not just a single moment. But then also, that word that goes in you is inspired, it is curious, it is hungry to know more. Because a disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is someone being coached. A disciple is a follower wanting to be like. And uh, you, you, if you don't want to be like Jesus, why are you a Lutheran? right? It's a good question. And if you don't want to be like Jesus, like I'll raise my hand and say, it's kind of hard. He seems weird. Long hair and sheep. Odd. Okay. Don't start with that because you don't know him. You got to get to know the Old Testament to know Jesus. You really do. So start with Paul. Get to know Paul in Acts. Again, see his life as he ends up in Berea with these people who convert, including the, the few Greeks. Those are, again, Jews that speak Greek. But then let's go to Jesus. You want to get to know Jesus? Jesus is some, he's some crazy. Uh, Luke, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 24. Uh, you know, he goes back to his hometown, Nazareth. Big crowds. They've heard about him. He's not just talking nice, this guy. This guy's doing things like lepers, right? 
that kind of thing. Healing, casting out demons. Uh, they, they've heard of him. Uh, and he, he comes back, and, and that's all fine and good. He goes into the synagogue. It's what he does anywhere on, on Sabbath day. It's where you go. And if you're recognized as an elder, as a respectable man, there's a good chance that you're handed the Bible to read at one point in the service. It's like kind of like this, but you have the elders. There's multiples of you. And if you have a visiting one or something, you may recognize him and let him get up and read and say what it says. And, and so Jesus does that, and they hand him the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads these words. And, and I, can you, I don't think you can. I don't think you can imagine the brass in this most traditional of places in the world where they kill you for disobedience, opening up the Bible and reading what he reads, we'll go through it, and then sitting down and saying, so that's about me. I hope you'd run me out of town. Yeah? Except for that, because it's about Jesus, we did this last week, it is about you. It is about what he's here to do to you. He's not afraid of them in his town. They're not going to kill him. He knows that. They're cowards. He knows that. He doesn't need miracles and prophecy to know when he's going to die. He reads it in the text. And he knows a man when he sees him. But he's here then not to condemn a man. That's John 3.16, right? He's here for this. Here's the words he finds. Verse 18, the spirit of God, Jesus, the Father, the Trinity, yes, the Spirit of God's upon me because he has anointed me. That's christened in Greek. That's Mashiach, right? In Hebrew, chosen though, elect, set apart. He has anointed me to do some stuff, to preach the good news to the poor. Let's come back and end on that. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. There we go. Let me share something with you, St. Paul. Got a moment? I have word. One of my best friends, my best friend perhaps. Hard to know. I haven't seen him for a good long while, but he's planning to move to Rockford. He's planning to come to St. Paul. He's broken hearted. And I told him, well, that's what we are. St. Paul's a place where it's okay to be brokenhearted. No one here has to pretend to be more than they are. We just walk with the word and with each other. And that healing, that alone, that security, knowing you belong, that's a, that's a thing today, isn't it? Not around everywhere. To proclaim liberty to the captives, that's walking to liberty right there, the freedom I've been talking about all morning. The recovery of sight to the blind. I mean, Jesus heals blind men, but for you, it's about wisdom. It's about seeing what's around you. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, this is freedom from your sin. And your sin is not just these things you do, it's the way you talk to yourself in the name of the devil and don't realize you're doing it. All the things you say to yourself in his name, shame on you, shame on you all day long, that's not Jesus. That's not how God treats you. That's not how God fathers, shame on you. That's not what he does. You're, you're to be set at liberty from this by the spirit of Jesus to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee. The Jubilee is a cool thing in the Old Testament. It means everything's free. Whatever debt you have, whatever else you've done, it's over. It's free this year, every 49 years. They never did it to my knowledge, actually. They never brought it around. But that's what he says, again, as the gospel, the good news for the poor. The poor being, yeah, those who are not in charge. Doesn't mean you don't have money. The poor can have a gold coin buried under his couch, hoping that no one steals it. It's possible. Doesn't make him rich. Uh, uh, so the poor is a state of mind. It really is a mindset in which the things matter more than God who gave them and will give more. And then more than the people who God gave is the most important things. The good news to you who are too poor to have control and to protect all those things you would is that God is doing so for you. And he's doing so in Christ far before or around any way you already thought of it in a better way where even the deed is done, as Luther wrote for us to sing. Ah. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Can I, can I turn it then back on you? Whatever is done to Jesus by God is done to you. 
So when Jesus says the spirit of God is on me, that quote from the Bible is now, it's fair, fair game for your confirmation verse. It really is. It is who you are. Do you listen when the children who are not communing yet come up, the different things I say? I've said different things over the years. Recently, it's been God has chosen you in your baptism. It's so imperative that you believe this. You're anointed. You're messiahs, every one of you, little tiny ones. You're not the messiah. and You're not going to die for the sins of the world. And nobody needs you to atone for anything. But the spirit of Jesus is on you because he's chosen you to proclaim the good news. For the poor of heart, and again, that can include the mirror, fair game. He sent you to heal the brokenhearted. That, that can include yours. While you share the burdens of others here, you'll find that walking with those who've walked where you've walked, it's, it helps you breathe a little bit. And he sent you to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. He sent you to become wise. And to be able to have a tongue that isn't a flattering tongue, but one that builds up with truth, that echoes, rings for all. He has sent you to set at liberty those oppressed. And it begins with you. It doesn't end with you. It's about us. It's the Reformation. It is God fixing things. And from the beginning, it was not so, and yet he foresaw it. The fall, the breaking of the world, which is why we're all brokenhearted. All of that is well in hand. And what we remember then as Lutherans is that no matter what other stories come, what other names get put up, what other great memories are there that make you think, yes, this. Christianity will not cease sojourning in this world without the need for you to daily reform your heart by turning to God and saying, I need you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Please rise for prayer.